Hello, welcome to Whiskey and Sunshine Off Grid. I'm Scott. I'm Shelly. We get a lot of questions uh, lately, a lot about a couple of different issues that seem to be popping up all the time, it's frequently asked questions, I guess. Uh, we get a lot of questions about our tractor, which is understandable because a lot of people are into all that. And uh, we'll do our best to answer all those that we can. And uh, also, the, you know, with us being off grid, there's a lot of questions about that and uh, how we how we live on solar power and you know kind of what our what our existence is like here you know and I think a lot of people are confused when they hear the term off grid they I don't know they get a vision of certain things in their head mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's different yeah. for everybody else but um, that happened recently yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's, I, but I like to take showers. She's yeah, like, yeah. And I, so and, do we. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's the thing. Uh, the life that we live here is really no different than we did when we were in town. Everything here is the same. All the lights are electric. They all turn on and off with a switch. Uh, we have a gas stove and a gas dryer. Uh, the generator runs on gas. But, I mean, we have everything everybody else does. We have a regular electric microwave, uh, electric coffee maker, a dishwasher, refrigerator, a couple freezers, a um, washing machine. You know, this is a three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath, 2,000-square-foot colonial. It looks like it should be on Main Street. It doesn't look like it belongs out here in the woods where it is. It's kind of just how things worked out. We found it, and... It was big enough. Actually, we thought it was too big. Now we don't think that anymore. No. <laughs> We've kind of grown into it, I guess. I mean, it would be nice to have a little log cabin somewhere instead yes, of a great would. big house. But I simple, mean, but... we do enjoy having the kids come. Our granddaughter has her own room. She has toys. She has her own bed. Yeah. So. And it heats good. It's very efficient. It was very well, very well insulated. We're fortunate enough. So the, the people that designed and built the place uh, before we were here... They bought the best windows they could possibly buy. Uh, the walls are double walled. Everything's overbuilt to the max, so it's very tight. And we need that because that, that helps it heat good in the winter months. And it actually it helps it stay cool in the summer for that one thing that we cannot run would be an air conditioner. So there's no opportunity. We, we do not have enough power to run air conditioners here. Those are the single biggest power sucking device I mean, I realize down south, you know, you guys need them. Uh, what that's going to involve is you're going to have to have a bigger system. You know, if you want to get off grid, you're going to have to have a bigger system. Uh, that's, all, that's all it is to it. I, I, I see this as being a big um, solar outfit, a big system, but there are a lot of them around that are a lot bigger. There's one just a few doors down that makes this thing look like an erectus set. So... What I thought we'd do is I'd do a little walkthrough and I'd show you all of the components and, you know, from sunshine in to, to power out and give you some kind of an idea of uh, what we have here and, uh, you know, how stuff works. Now, like I said before, we'd be glad to, you know, answer any questions. I'm not going to get real deep into what we run for a generator today. I'll do that at another time. But... Uh, you know, that's, that's also an option. We have to have a generator, uh, mostly because of the days of the, the sun doesn't really come out. Like right now, I think we're producing a, a whopping 8 watts of, of solar power, which isn't even enough to light a 10-watt light bulb. So what we're using is coming out of the batteries. It's not getting replaced. If we have another cloudy day tomorrow, we'll have to run the generator to charge that battery bank back up. That's, that's always a thing that you have to keep an eye on is the current, current state of your batteries all the time. You want to make them last as long as you possibly can. Treat them good and you never want to deplete them uh, below half of what your charge range should be. People think of it being a 24-volt system. Uh, they're under the false assumption that you can run that all the way flat until you don't have lights anymore and then... Tomorrow you can charge it back up and be all good again. It doesn't work that way. These are standard lead-acid batteries. Um, 
If you think about your car, what happens when you run the battery flat and then get it boosted, it's not good for it. Even if it's a brand new battery, it takes a lot of life out of it. That would be the same thing. Uh, these batteries in this system share a lot more with, as far as technology, with your, uh, with your car and your pickup truck than they do with your cell phone or with other wireless stuff that you recharge. They're definitely not made to be run flat. You should never really go any lower than 24 volts on a 24 volt system. So when you're at a full charge, you're maybe 26 volts. That gives you two usable volts of power. It's what you do with those volts that matters. And you can do a lot with two volts of power because it's not really about the volts. Really what it's about is the amps and the draw. But uh, that's something we're not going to get into the mathematical formulas and all that. It, I see all these videos on solar online and they're either way oversimplified and not factual or a lot of them are way over the top into the tech and it's really hard for most people to understand and get a grasp on how things work. So I thought maybe I'd make a video or two to, to let you guys know what we have. You can see like what we're doing. And hey, we're way up here in the in the woods of Maine, so if we can make this work up here in the North Country, it should work just about anywhere. You know, you have to have to make concessions. Like I told you, we're never going to have an air conditioner here. It's you know ceiling fans and uh, little room fans and stuff like that, and that, and making sure you keep the the house closed up when it's hot outside. But it really isn't that bad, really, considering. So do you have anything to add to that? I don't. <laughs> we've, I'm full of information. We've, we've both gotten pretty good at uh, <laughs> understanding the information that our system gives us to know when it's time to start the generator and when it, you know, is a good time to just let it set and see what happens the next day. Um, you know, prior planning helps too. If you know you're going to have a day where you're going to be doing a lot of heavy washing and vacuuming and stuff like that. You can wait till a time when you have to run the generator and you can be running your generator at the same time you're doing all that stuff. That way you're not taking any power out of your batteries and anything you're not using goes directly to your batteries to charge them. So that helps a lot. I mean, you have to kind of think tactically. Um, the same as not leaving a bunch of lights on all the time. If we're not in a room, the lights get turned off because we, we can't afford to, to use that power. Yep. I guess the only other thing that we would do different is our light bulbs. Most most of our light bulbs, if not all now, are LED, right? Uh, not quite all, but I've slowly changed them all over. Some, Most of them over, I should say. Originally, they were all compact fluorescents. That's what they were going to when this house was put in. So when we moved in, it had all the little corkscrew, little screwy bulbs and uh, we've slowly been replacing those all with, with LED. They do use substantial, substantially less power. Uh, I think they're safer and I think they last longer. They are expensive, but again, it's, it's uh, what you get out of them. The price is coming down on them now, though, I've noticed. It's not as bad as yeah. when they first came out. They're not so, so bad. And compact fluorescence did the same thing, but yep. at least with an LED, if you drop it and it breaks, you don't have to worry about all the poisonous crap that's inside of it. and. All that other stuff. I've never been a big fan of fluorescent bulbs. I have some, but, you know, they, they're they a necessary evil for some things. But anyway, so that being said, I'll take you outside and we'll, uh, we'll start on our little tour. These are our solar panels or our solar array. Anytime you have more than one panel hooked together, they call that an array as opposed to a flock or a bunch. And each one of these solar panels at peak is supposed to produce 150 watts. They're rated for a 150 watt panel and we have 12. So if you want to do the math, that's going to come out to about 1800 watts of power. Now that's the maximum. And what that means is that maximum production, the best things can possibly be, is you're going to have enough power to light 18 100 watt light bulbs and that's it you know a lot of people hear something like 1800 watts and they uh 
they go all haywire thinking they've got an unbelievable amount of power, but you don't. You know, you're storing it all the time. It's, uh, it's going into your batteries, whatever you don't use. That's why these people with grid tide system are kind of, well, they're kind of getting screwed because if they don't have any place to store that power, their option is to either sell it back to the grid at a, at a control price or you just lose it. So it's kind of a use it or lose it situation. So now on the back side, you can see, or actually I'll show you these, these adjustments here, all these bolts. Okay, those that bottom one is, is your adjustment for north and south. We leave that one alone. Then these top two, you can loosen and adjust a whole set of four panels all at the same time. And we change those in spring and fall at the equinox. Um, if you wanted to have a neutral location so that you'd get the most you could get all year long without having to mess with them, you'd set you'd set the uh, panels right at your latitude. Uh, in this case, right now, we're doing latitude plus 15 degrees for the cold months, and then in the warm months, you basically do latitude minus 15 degrees. So they're they're laying more flat like this, which actually makes it nice in the cold months when you get snow because the snow slides right off from them. You don't have to clean them off very much. We do every now and then. You know, it does happen, but they're very solid. They don't move. They're bolted down. They're bolted down pretty tight. You can see they're all they're all wired up, chained together. Each distribution box runs into a main cable down to here in this box. And then from here, it's a buried line underneath my buddy Yeti over there, and then it goes right into the basement. You can see over there. So that's our next stop of the solar tour, the basement. Okay, on into the basement. This is the room where the majority of the electronics are kept. And I'll show you this south-facing wall, this gray pipe right here, that you can see run out through. That actually holds the wire that comes from the uh, solar array. It goes through the wall beside the chimney. And that comes right into the the box here this disconnect that's the uh, disconnect for your batteries and also over here on this side is a small disconnect right here that is for I don't know if you can see my hand or not there there it is there's another disconnect for the array on the same box now this box up here is actually your charge controller that is a very common, used to be Xantrax, before that it was Trace Inverter, and uh, now I believe they've gone over to Connex to his bottom, but they actually, um, the charge control themselves have never changed. They're a very simple unit, it just kind of sits there. The only thing you can do with it is uh, just to equalize your batteries, you can do that, you can set it to do that with your uh, charge controller if you're getting enough sun to equalize with. Most of the time you have to do it with your generator. On top of the box we've got a lightning arrester that stops all, all backflow of current so you're not going to damage if there's any kind of a power surge. Supposedly it'll even work for EMP, I don't know. But uh, the only thing we've ever had go bad was these charge controllers. I've replaced two of those since we've been here. Uh, they're not all that expensive. They're just over $100 I think. And I've gotten fairly good at changing them, so we just, I keep one stocked, wrapped in foil, and inside the gun safe. So, power comes out of the charge controller, and goes down into the battery box. We will go there next. As you can see, this is the, uh, the battery box. It contains uh, 24 batteries. There's your charge controller, and your uh, disconnects. The cables go into the battery box. Now, on, underneath there, you can see a bunch of gallons of uh, distilled water we've saved up. We check our water level and check our batteries at least once a month, or we try to. And we leave a, uh, a log discussing what we found. That way, if we've got a problem battery, it shows up by looking back at the log books. 
this here is a an extraction like a vent pipe this blower when your uh, when your batteries get to the point where the voltage gets to uh, what they call float stage that little blower that little fan starts going and it pulls the uh, hydrogen gas out of the battery box up through this pipe and blows it out underneath the deck outside and vents it to the outside world so underneath this box uh, the lid open here you got your 24 6 volt Trojan T105 golf cart batteries now even though these are 6 volt batteries the way they're wired up this system's running at 24 volts okay so it's a 24 volt system you could have run it at 12 if you wanted to um, we've got inverters and stuff we actually the biggest reason we have to run a 24 volt system is because our well pump is a drilled well it's a deep well pump and it requires 220 power so that's why we have to have all the extra batteries and we have to have it wired the way that we do that's a lot of batteries to check once a month but you know it it, uh, it beats paying a power bill I guess but uh, most of the time they're in here out of sight out of mind you know and these are five years old as you can tell they still look like they uh, well, let's look like they're brand new. You don't see any corrosion or anything on the terminals. You know, we try to take care of them the best we can, hoping that they'll last. I'd like to think we could get 15 years out of them. I don't know. Maybe 10. Time will tell. So the cables come out of the batteries. And they go from the batteries through the other side of this disconnect on the outfeed side. And into my two inverters. Now, originally we had three. So there were two Xantrex 2400 watt inverters daisy chained together so that they would produce 220 instead of just 110. And they were modified sine wave instead of true sine wave. So a lot of the electronics in the house, they, they, they didn't like the electronics being modified sine wave. There were a lot of the sensitive stuff like the igniter for the oven and, and some things like that did not like they did not like that at all the modified sine wave so this small inverter over here is another small 110 inverter that's wired to a couple of outlets just in the kitchen and this is actually a uh, 110 it's not set up for 220 but it's set up for true sine wave so that, that lets you get true sine wave power for all your sensitive electronics. So that was the way they got by that. Now our, our two 110 inverters were not very efficient. They were not working very well. And the solar company recommended that we update and buy this single 4,000 watt true sine inverter. And it was supposed to do everything we wanted to do. And it, and it pretty much has. Um, this, pretty, this is a, a Schneider Electric and they're the ones who bought out uh, Xantrax, who originally bought out Trace Engineering. So it's been the same company, but it's changed hands a few times. Um, this one is a Connex SW4024. So, so that is a 4200 watt, I think, uh, true sign. So it's true sine wave. So that made the other inverter redundant, but it's here. I never bothered to disconnect it. Of course, you have a set of controls down here. You have uh, these panels. You can go through all the different screens and see what is going on with your system at any given time. And we have a couple of remotes upstairs that I'll show you in the uh, in the hallway. And those actually, there's one for the for the uh, um, charge controller, and there's also one up there that's hooked directly to the battery bank. But if you want to do anything with the inverter itself, you have to come down and run this this big one here. Now, just like having a generator at home for backup, um, we have to have a three-position blade switch that's set off. You know, this this here, uh, the up position is inverter, which means you're running from your batteries, and it will run from your generator too because your inverter once it senses 
uh, AC power coming from your generator, the inverter switches over and becomes a battery charger. So the generator outside, while it's running, is powering your house. The power that's left over is back fed through your panels, back into your batteries. And that's how you charge your batteries. If you want to disconnect your panels from the whole system and just run off the generator itself, you pull this lever down to the generator side and that disconnects the batteries completely. The inverter or the generator will still charge the batteries, but no power will come out of the batteries. And the middle, the middle selection here would be off. And uh, that's pretty much self-explanatory. That cuts the power to everything. And other than that, things are pretty much, I mean, our breaker box looks just like anybody else's breaker box. You know, it's just how the power arrives there that's different. We've had to modify things a little bit as we went. This down here is what uh, they call a Canadian start. Uh, if I turn that on and let it run in automatic, the generator will start at 24.3 volts. And the problem with that is I've got a, I've got one relay down here I think that is bad, and it won't shut off when it reaches the desired charge, so it just stays running. So for the most part, we don't we don't mess with that. I don't I don't screw with it at all. I, I leave it I leave it alone, and uh, when I want to start the generator, I just step outside and push a button. It's also better. Um, we leave the fuse out of the generator, the master fuse, so the, the battery that starts the, uh, the generator, it's a push-button start. Um, the battery that starts the generator isn't getting constantly drained, just sitting there waiting and looking for uh, a difference in voltage. While that fuse is in there, that generator is computerized and it's scanning, reading the system voltage all the time. And if you go a long time without running the generator, it runs the battery flat. Plus, I always like to be able to check the oil, you know, before I start any of my small engines. So it's not that much of a hassle just to open the hood, check the oil, and push the start button. But that's, uh, that's the nuts and bolts behind the whole solar power equipment setup. It's a lot, but it doesn't seem like it. Everything else is pretty much just like everybody else's normal house. I mean, you see stuff here like that. That is a booster for our satellite TV. It has nothing to do with nothing to do with anything else. Because God knows, when you think living off grid, you think of satellite TV, right? But uh, yeah, anyway, that's the that's the whole that's the whole system in a nutshell. In our hallway that leads to the basement, we've got our two remote controls. Uh, this one, this monitor, goes to the batteries, the battery bank. As you can see right now, at 24.8 volts, 10.1 uh, amps negative that we've drawn. Amp hours, 12.121. Uh, uh, okay, that 90, that's your battery level and percentage. So right now we're at 90% capacity, which is good. I mean, it's for this time of year, it's good. We ran the generator yesterday. So that's about what it should be, I guess. And uh, I'm going to leave that up with what's in the batteries. When we see this get to 24.3 or around there, we just go out and fire up the generator. Now, this bottom one, as you can see, says Trace Engineering on it. So you could probably figure that that goes right downstairs to the Xantrex um, charge controller. And that gives you your information from your panels right now. Uh, resettable amp hours, we're at uh, 47,289.7. That's not too bad. <laughs> we're working on 48,000 amp hours. Uh, as you can see, we're not bringing in much. That's what we're bringing in from our panels. Right now it's only 24 watts. And again, uh, battery voltage. So that's telling us what, uh, what the state is of the... It tells you what's in the batteries, but it also tells you what the... Uh, Panels are bringing in. You just have to know how to read it. This flashing light uh, right now, anywhere from uh, half full up to full charge, will be blinking one solid green light like that. 
when it's almost completely topped off after it goes through bulk and float and absorb and all the other states are charged, this, this will start flashing five times and then it will be on solid. That means you've got as much in them as you can possibly get. And by that time, you hear the little fan running downstairs that uh, is pulling the, the uh, hydrogen gas that's caused by the charging batteries outside the house. Because hydrogen gas is an explosive, and you, you really don't want that around. So you want to make sure they're vented. That's important. But uh, anyway, so we don't, we don't need to go downstairs to uh, check on the status of our batteries and our inverter and everything. We can get most of the time, we can get the information right here. And if we have to make any changes to anything, we just go downstairs and change it on the master panel for the inverter. So uh, I know it sounds like a lot, but it's really no harder than understanding how a thermostat works with a furnace or anything like that. Once you're used to it, it's, uh, it just becomes second nature. It's really no big deal. All the connections on these are done with regular like phone cable like you'd have for your uh, USB or anything on your computer. So there's nothing, nothing very fancy about any of it at all. <laughs>